Okay, so here is lecture three for chapter one, and this will wrap up what I have to tell you about chapter one. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about the different errors that you can have in part writing, specifically as you move from one chord to another chord. When I was talking about writing an individual chord in open or close position, I already talked about some errors that you can have there. You can have a gap bigger than an octave between the soprano and the alto, or between the alto and the tenor. Or you could have a voice crossing with the tenor going above the alto, or the alto going above the soprano. You could also have a doubling error, and you could also uh, leave a note out of a chord. For instance, you could leave the third out of the chord and have only roots and fifths. So now let's think about the things that you want to avoid doing as you move from one chord to another chord. Let me emphasize that if you follow the voice leading models that are in chapter one that I went over with you in, uh, in my second lecture, you won't make these errors. So as long as you can do the voice leading as prescribed in a very, granted in a very rigid and unimaginative way, uh, you're not going to have any of these mistakes. Um, as we gradually go on, we'll have more and more options for how we can move from one chord to another. We'll be using different inversions and different chords and maybe even different doublings. And so we'll see our possibilities expand, but you always want to uh, be on the lookout for these core errors in part writing. Probably the most serious error is to have parallel perfect fifths or parallel perfect octaves. Okay, here's the definition in your book. Parallel fifths or parallel octaves result when two voices move by parallel motion from a perfect fifth to another perfect fifth. It has to be in the same two voices and it has to be going from a perfect fifth to another perfect fifth. If you have a repeated chord, like let's say you have a chord uh, where the bass is C, the tenor is G, the alto is C, and the soprano is E. If you then repeat that chord, yes, you're going to have a perfect fifth from C to G in the first chord, and you'll have a perfect fifth from C to G in the second chord, but it's not another perfect fifth. It's the same perfect fifth. So take a look at example 1.9. Measure B, both the first measure and the second measure, and then also measure C, show you examples of parallel fifths and parallel octaves. Here's a one chord going to a five chord. There's a perfect fifth between the bass and the tenor. And then in the very next chord, there's another perfect fifth between the bass and the tenor. That gives us parallel perfect fifths. Notice that this came about because the hypothetical person who did this uh, did not write the second chord in proper close position as I explained. They don't have a complete triad in the upper voices. If they had kept the C as a common tone so that the second chord read from the top down G, E, and C, then we wouldn't have the parallel perfect fifths. There's nothing inherently wrong with doubling the fifth of the five chord, but in this particular case it leads to parallel perfect fifths. Here's an example of parallel perfect octaves. Uh, again, the five chord has this unusual doubling of the fifth being doubled. And the one chord has the not quite so unusual doubling of having the third being doubled. But the fact that, that we have this unusual doubling and that the person isn't really paying attention to what they're doing means that we have an octave from G to G between the tenor and the soprano. And then here we have an octave from A to A between the tenor and the soprano. What would be much better would be for the tenor to be on a middle C in both chords. That way both chords would have a complete triad in the upper voices and we wouldn't have those parallel octaves. Now letter C looks like it wouldn't be a case of parallel fifths, but uh, Roy Francoli and many other theory books uh, use the curious term parallel fifths by contrary motion. Um, I'll probably just call these contrary fifths, but this is just as bad as actual parallel fifths. The bass and the soprano are a fifth apart or a twelfth apart, uh, F up to C. Uh, 
Then when we move to this chord, the bass and the soprano are again a fifth apart, or in this case, a fifth plus two octaves. So that's as if the bass were going up to a C and the soprano were going from a C up to a G. It still is basically parallel perfect fifths. Those are things that you want to avoid. A second error that's um, somewhat similar, maybe not quite as bad as the parallels, but it has the same effect of robbing the voices of their independence. That would be when we approach one of these perfect intervals by similar motion between the soprano and the bass, and the soprano is moving by leap. We call that a direct perfect fifth or a direct perfect octave. Let me repeat again um, what's involved in a direct perfect fifth or a direct perfect octave. This happens between the outer voices always, between the soprano and the bass. If those two voices move into a perfect interval by similar motion, and if there's a leap but in the soprano, it winds up uh, emphasizing that perfect interval in a not very pleasant way, and that's what we call a direct fifth or direct octave. So here, uh, in example 1.10a, the bass is going up from C to F, the soprano is going up from A to C. So they're moving into a perfect fifth or perfect twelfth by similar motion, and the soprano has a leap. Here we have a similar thing, but now the bass is moving for, by, uh, from F up to C. So now we're approaching an octave by similar motion in the bass and the soprano with leaping motion in the soprano. If you have stepwise motion in the soprano, then we no longer have a direct fifth or direct octave. So what is shown in letter B is okay. I talked in an earlier lecture about a voice crossing. A voice crossing is something that you have within a single chord where the voices are not in the correct order from top to bottom. Now, a voice overlap is something that happens as you move from chord to chord. If one of the voices is overlapping into the range of the other voice. Let's take a look at letter A. Letter A shows two voice overlaps in a row. As we move from the first chord to the second chord, the soprano leaps down from A to E, and in doing so, she winds up being below the note that the alto had previously had. In other words, she's overlapping into the alto's register. The reason that this is not a good idea is that it makes it hard for the alto to find her note. The alto knows that she needs to go down to find her note, but if the soprano is leaping down to the E, the altos may just go to the E instead. Okay, and then when we return to the F major chord, now the alto is overlapping into the soprano's register. So the, the alto is going up by leap and leaps to a note that's higher than the note that the soprano had in the previous chord. That is a voice overlap and it's to be avoided. Letter B shows you a voice crossing where the alto goes up over the sopranos. Uh, sopranos don't like that. Sopranos really want to be the high, high voice in the texture, so don't cross them. And a third error that's illustrated here is the error of approaching a unison in similar motion. You should never approach a unison in similar motion, and of course not in parallel motion. Parallel unisons are just as bad as parallel octaves. In this case, the two voices are approaching the unison, both going up, and that creates a small voice overlap with the alto uh, leaping up to a note which is higher than the note that the soprano previously had. It is better to approach a unison by contrary motion like this, or perhaps by oblique motion. Uh, two other errors I want to mention. These go back to things that we covered in chapter F, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. But um, you should avoid in any one of your voices having a melodic augmented interval. Okay, so if you're in a major key, watch out that nobody is leaping from fa up to T, that's an augmented fourth. If you're in a minor key, make sure that nobody's going from lay 
up to T, that would be an augmented second. Okay, so know where your tritone is in the key that you're in, and also if you're in minor, uh, be careful about that, that minor scale degree six lay. Be sure that that note is going down, never up to T. The final error that you can make is to have a leading tone in one of the outer voices, in the soprano or in the bass, and not move that leading tone to tonic. This will particularly be a problem if we're going from a dominant chord to a tonic chord. Let me show you that. Here's the correct voice leading to go from a five to a one. This is the voice leading that's taught in chapter one that I want you to practice while we're in chapter one. As we go on to chapter two, we'll see that there are other ways that you can move between a five chord and a one chord or between any two chords whose roots are a fourth or a fifth apart. Um, and once we get those into our repertoire, there we'll particularly have to be careful about this thing of the leading tone resolving. But the leading tone here is in the soprano, which is one of the outer voices. And we can really hear it here when it's the highest note of the chord. So our ear expects it to resolve to tonic. If it doesn't resolve to tonic, we'll get something like this. Here, incidentally, is an example of all four voices moving down. Um, so that might be a little bit problematic. Here we have scale degree seven, and instead of going to scale degree one, it goes to scale degree five. And this is what's called a frustrated leading tone. The poor leading tone really wants to go to tonic, and if you don't let it go to tonic, it will be so frustrated. You don't want to do that. Okay, a byproduct of having this frustrated leading tone is that we're approaching the perfect fifth between the bass and the soprano in similar motion, and there's a leap in the soprano. So now, in addition to the frustrated leading tone, we also have a direct perfect fifth. Okay, so that's bad too. Let me play these two for you. Um, so that you can hear a correct resolution and then an incorrect resolution. Uh, with this one, I hope that you hear that it doesn't sound classical. I hope that you hear that the note that you expect in the soprano doesn't happen and that that's maybe a little frustrating for you as well. Um, and also listen to the prominence of this perfect fifth from C to G as a result of that direct fifth. So here's what these sound like. So in addition to the spacing errors that I talked about in the first lecture, you want to be careful to avoid parallel perfect fifths, perfect octaves, perfect unisons, perfect twelfths, direct perfect fifths, perfect octaves, perfect unisons, perfect twelfths. Uh, you want to avoid a voice overlap, which is different from a voice crossing. You want to avoid an incorrect approach to a unison. Unison should be a, a approached by contrary or oblique motion, not by parallel or similar motion. Fifth, you want to avoid melodic augmented intervals, especially the augmented fourth or augmented second, but really any augmented interval. And finally, the leading tone, especially if it's in the soprano or in the bass, needs to resolve to tonic. We need to have that T do. If it's in an inner voice, we can get away with uh, not resolving it because that will, will be less apparent to the ear. That's what you have to know for chapter one, and we'll be doing some drills on this in class. Thanks.